But now, now we have the wonderful Helen Garrett, our associate vicar, is going to come and speak to us. So let's give Helen a warm welcome Woo! as she comes. Um, oh, I'd love to um, add my welcome to Dan and Kate's this morning. It's so good to see everybody here. Really good to see you if you're new to St. Peter's, maybe new to Brighton. Um, but it's also great to see um, familiar faces that have been away for the summer um, and great to see you back. And it's now the beginning of September and finally summer has come to Brighton. So we're all back at school, back in the normal run of, the, of life, and it's going to be sunny this week. So it's down the beach, working on the beach this week. Um, it is the start of term, isn't it? Whether or not this is something for you because you work in a school, you've got kids who go to school, you've got kids at university, you're at university, um, it's the start of a new term. It's the start of a new academic year. And I think there's something that seems to be hardwired into us, that whether or not it's our, our personal experience, we have the sense that this is like another new start in the year. And so I wanted to talk this morning um, about something that as I've been thinking about um, a new term, a new year, um, actually what was being ticking away in, in, in my head and, and in my heart. And um, the slight clue was in the title when it came up, it's gone now, but um, it was around fruitfulness. And I think there's something about um, a new academic year or a new term that sometimes gets us thinking about, okay, so what am I going to be doing that will be fruitful? What is going to be a, a kind of positive outcome of, of what happens through this year, through, through this term? Um, and, and some of the time we can get tied up in that. Some of us love a goal. So some of us love the start of something new and we're going, right, by the end of this term, I want to achieve this. Um, other of us find actually that quite threatening and difficult. And we see, well, in the circumstances I'm in at the moment, it's as much as I can do to kind of get to the next day, not be thinking about goals in the future. So I wanted this morning for us to spend a little bit of time um, looking at what Jesus has to say about fruitfulness. So as we start this new term, this new academic year, we might start from this position of, of knowing something about the truth about how he sees us um, and what bearing fruit looks like um, as, as those who follow Jesus. Um, now, he has a bit to say about it, and there's one particular passage that um, we're going to look at this morning, and it's in John's Gospel. So it's in John's account of Jesus' life, and we're going to um, John chapter 15. Now, you'll find Bibles on the pillars of the church around the back. If you want to look at it in a hard copy, it's going to be really very near the end of the Bible um, because we're kind of right in the um, New Testament. We're looking at John chapter 15, and um, Jesus is saying these words. We're going to start at verse 1. Um, and Jesus is talking to those who've been following him most closely just before he, he kind of comes to the end of his life. And he says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that bears fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that's thrown away and withered. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Just going to... 
There's a couple more verses there that I've got on one copy and not on the other. So hang on. Don't want to miss the last bit. Okay, so let's go for the end of that little bit. Oh, my goodness. I actually um, haven't copied it. That's the problem with copying stuff onto the iPad. Um, sorry? Oh, it's behind me. Oh, there, you'd have a read of it yourself then. Um, my eyesight means I can't read that. It's too small for me, but you guys can read it. And don't miss the final verse there, verse 11. Um, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. That's um, a really important ending um, for, this, for this particular um, passage. So we've got a passage, there's a lot in this passage, um, and there's a lot of stuff that we might have questions about, and we're not going to be able to look at all of it today. So I am going to focus on just a couple of things. But first, a little bit of, of background. So Jesus, um, in John's Gospel, he's recorded as of having a number of these I am sayings when he does a little bit of teaching to those who are around him, and he starts that teaching with I am. And then he paints a picture. He uses a metaphor to talk about something about himself and um, about us, something about our relationship with him and how we can live in it more fully. And so what we have here is this picture of a vine and branches. And for the people who heard it in the, in the first instance, the word fine, that kind of triggered something in them, a memory in them. Because in the Old Testament, um, the vine is often used to describe the people of Israel. So this is not the modern state of Israel. We're not talking about that political state. We're talking about the people of Israel in the Old Testament. And they're quite often referred to as a vine. Um, and the history of the people and the history of the kingdom of Israel in the Old Testament is checkered to say the least, if you know something of that history. There were times when they were really close to God. And there were times when they turned away from him. And the kings that they had were evil and corrupt. And the nations became evil and corrupt. And so Jesus, as he starts this, um, this little bit of teaching for them and for us, says, I am the true vine. He identifies himself as this true king of Israel. They've been waiting for a king. They've been waiting for someone who's going to bring freedom and new life and a new kingdom. And Jesus is saying, I am that person who's going to bring this new life. Jesus himself, God himself, came down from heaven to earth, born as a baby in Bethlehem, lived in Palestine, and he's coming towards his death on the cross. His death on the cross where he bears all the wrongdoing of everyone in the world, bears all of that sin, and destroys the power of sin and death, rising to glory and offering new life in this new kingdom. And so we're in this context. He's talking to his followers then and to us now just before that's about to happen, just before this, this momentous event. And he invites us into this life with him. It's his invitation to come and be in this life with him. Um, and this picture of vines and branches, well, it takes us to the garden. It makes us think about growth. It makes us think about fruit. It makes us think about um, connectedness because a vine has to be connected to the branches to produce fruit. It's this image of interconnectedness. And there are the two things that I'd love to focus on this morning out of this passage. Two things that particularly struck me as I was reading this and thinking, okay, Lord, so how am I going to approach this new term? What does it mean that I bear fruit that, um, that I can be fruitful for you. And the first one centers around this remaining in Jesus. It's connectedness to him. And Jesus says, remain in me as I also remain in you. So our connectedness with Jesus is not somehow our um, effort to sort of kind of go, Jesus, I want to be connected to you, I want this relationship, come on, come on, come on, be related to me. It's a two-sided thing. 
He is in us and we are in him. He is completely invested in this relationship that we have with him. And in fact, he's the one that makes it happen in the first place. It's his loving actions on the cross that bring us into a relationship with him. But here he's encouraging us to remain in that relationship, to know, to explore what it is that we've already got in him. It's not about striving for him to love us. It's about learning to experience all of what that means for us. And it's at the very heart of what it is to follow Jesus, to be a Christian, is to know that we are in, deeply in this relationship with him. Um, and he gives us two ways in which we can explore this remaining in him, um, explore the depth of what that is. And the first is, he talks about my words remaining in you. Um, and this is, it is what Jesus says. But it's not just the words that he uses. It's also the whole of who he is. Because he is described as the word, the word made flesh. And so it's all of his actions. And so at the start of this term, as we go, okay, Jesus, what is it to remain in you? love to encourage us to, to remember, to go back and look at who Jesus is again. And the easiest place to go and do that is to look at the Gospels in the New Testament to Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. They all tell the account of Jesus. And as we read those, we see what he says. We see what he's like, how he behaves with the people around him we begin to see again what's important to him. What's important that he knows um, for us to, he wants us to know, but also what's important in terms of actions and what he wants us to do. So I'd love to encourage you to spend a bit of time um, at the beginning of the term and go, I'm going to spend a little bit of time with Jesus, his words and his actions and the other thing that he gives us is this, okay, this is the other way to remain more deeply in me, is prayer. Um, and the prayer is, is the conversation part of the relationship. It's the place where we bring all of who we are and all of what's going on into that space of relationship with Jesus. It's that point when we can tell him anything we need to. And we get to listen to what he has to say to us. It's not all about us talking, it's about us listening. And, and I don't know about you, but I find that some of the most um, helpful points of prayer are actually when I stop talking and I just listen a bit. It's easy to keep talking, but actually the listening I find is more helpful. When I um, bring the thing that's troubling me, the thing that's difficult in life, and, and just say, Lord, where are you in this? Where can you lead me in this? Um, and it's something that I find I need to do again and again and again, and you probably will as well. But it's at that point, in that kind of prayer, we have this incredible promise in this reading that you can ask anything in my name and I will do it. It's that prayer that aligns us with who Jesus is, what his will is, what his heart is, that gets answered. And we find ourselves in this flow of relationship because it's all about this relationship of his love and his grace towards us. Um, as part of my um, prayer, and what I find really helpful is that I listen to something called Lectio 365. Um, it's a prayer app that um, is devised by 24-7 Prayer. And, and I've been using it for quite a long time, and I find it a really helpful thing at the start of the day. Um, it's a free app. You can download it from the App Store. Ask me afterwards if you want to know about it. Um, and this week, there's been a guest hosting, a guy called Jonathan Tremaine. And he's been talking about Jesus and justice and leading prayer on that topic. And he's um, a black American Christian. He's the president of the civil righteousness movement. And he's a prayer. And he's an activist. He's um, a social transformer. He, he works in reconciliation. And he, um, one of his prayers this week was a, was a real example of that sense of being able to pray and ask to 
pray in what is God's heart. And I wanted to read it to us this morning because I thought it was, it was a really powerful example of what this is all about. So I'm going to read this prayer to us. Jesus, will you break my heart for what breaks yours? By your spirit, cause those who profess allegiance to your name to feel what you feel. Produce within your church tenderness that is rooted in godly sorrow. It's an example of, of opening ourselves up to what is on God's heart. And that kind of prayer starts to change us because it gives us space for God to start to lead us in our thoughts and in our emotions into where he's already going. It's a very powerful kind of a prayer. Um, and it's one of the ways in which we remain in Jesus, in which we experience and explore all of what this relationship is about. Um, one of the translations of the Bible translates that word that we've got, remain here, as abide. And I think that word abide adds a kind of slowness to the whole action of, of remaining. It has a sense of, of time spent of time to choose something over, not rushing on quickly, but time with Jesus. And I think that's, that's what he wants to offer us at the start of term, whatever our circumstances might be, to just encourage us to spend a bit of time with him. Now that time, depending on what life is like, can be really hard to find. Some of us are really time rich, and that's not a difficult thing to do. But some of us are time poor because we've got a whole lot of stuff that we're responsible for. But every little bit of time counts. So don't despise the few minutes that you pick up the Bible and read some of about what Jesus is, some of the words that he says. Don't despise the few minutes that you can catch to speak to Jesus in prayer. Start with the small bits, because the small bits really count. And I can speak out of experience. The small bits count. The long time is great, but don't, but don't not start because you can't pray for an hour at a time. Start on the small bits. Remaining in Jesus, connectedness to him, is at the heart of what it is to be in relationship with him. It's the heart of what he offers. This beautiful, grace-filled relationship of love that he offers to us and wants to be part, and invites us to be part of. So the second thing that I want to, to just touch on for, um, for this morning and we talked about this connected with this Jesus. And the other part is about producing fruit. Um, what is this fruit and how is it produced? In the, in the um, uh, passage, let's go back to verse 5. It says, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. There's something incredibly obvious about a living plant. You're not going to get any fruit off a vine if it's not connected to the branches and to the, um, and to the vine itself. So what Jesus is saying here is he's going, actually, in me, you're going to bear fruit. There's a reassurance we're going to bear fruit. But apart from me, you can't, you can't do this on your own. And what does the fruit look like? Well, first of all, what it's not. Um, and what it isn't is material success. It isn't about, you know, being able to um, achieve those projects or a certain salary or some kind of success in that sense in life. Fruitfulness that we're offered and invited to become a part of is something way more powerful than that. And it's not dependent on our circumstances. Some of us have got easy circumstances and success comes easily. Some of us, that's not the case. Um, but this is not something that depends on, on our success. This is fruit that, um, that, that lasts, that is, is, is strong, is, dip, is free from circumstance and present in every circumstance. 
Um, so it's, it's not just one thing, it's a number of things. What Jesus is telling us here and in that last verse um, is that it is joy. He says all of these things so that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be full. He longs for us to know the joy, the joy of our salvation, the joy that is more deep and powerful than happiness. It's joy that's possible in the most difficult of circumstance because it comes from his love and his life flowing through us. It's joy, we also hear here, that it's going to be peace. It's knowledge of his love. It's, it's fruit that is love for one another. It's fruit that's seen in obedience to what Jesus commands. Um, and, and later on, we learn something more about what this fruit that the, it's the Holy Spirit does, the growth in us, the fruit that is born. And Paul talks about it. And Paul talks about it in his letter to the Galatians. And he says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. It's all of these things. It's this fruit that he longs to, to um, grow within us. It's what we both experience ourselves, but it's also what we offer to those around us. That's amazing. It's not just something that we experience. It's something that Jesus says, you can bear this fruit and you can bless the people around you with this kind of fruit. And the other thing about the fruitfulness that he has in mind here is the context in which he's speaking. He's speaking at the end of his life on earth before he goes to the cross and he's raised from the dead and goes back to heaven. And he's giving his followers then and, and us now um, a mission, being invited to be part of his mission. Because Jesus loves those who don't know him yet. And he wants those who don't know him yet to love him. And he invites us to be part of that, part of that fruit that comes out of a relationship with him that he enables us to witness to that love to all the people around us. And so we are all in, involved in different communities, work communities, the places where we live, our neighbours, our families, the things we volunteer with, the people that we see. Through our, all of these are our communities. And these are the spaces in which he says, you can bear witness to me. I can use you, the fruit that's growing in you, to bless the people around you, which I think is an amazing gift to us. He wants us to be involved in this bearing of fruit that means that more people come to know him because he loves those who don't know him yet. Part of this bearing fruit, you'll have probably noticed, is that, is that line about um, God pruning, God the Father pruning in order to bear more fruit. Um, pruning um, is, is it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Um, I think when it happens personally, we're not quite so... It's not an uncomfortable thing. And actually, um, I find um, actual pruning of plants a little bit uncomfortable as well. Um, for a vine to produce fruit, it has to be tended. It has to be pruned. And actually, that's true for most plants. Um, I like pottering about and doing a bit of gardening, um, but I struggle with pruning. I don't really know what I'm doing. I need someone to teach me how to prune. Um, and and I, have a, I have two kinds of plants. I've got some lavender plants, and I've got a hydrangea. And um, with my lavender plants, I'm not doing very well. I don't really know how to prune it. It seems a bit drastic, cutting it all back. I just like it getting bigger. So I've allowed it to get bigger and bigger. And when um, I went to look at it the other day, most of it's kind of gray, and there's only a little bit that's green. Um, and I fear it's because I didn't prune it, because I allowed it to just grow any old way, and now it's not really growing at all, and it's not bearing anything like it's supposed to. Um, however, I have a hydrangea, and um, when I bought this, it came with instructions for pruning, my favorite kind of instructions when I'm gardening. And um, this hydrangea, it's in flower at the moment, so it has these beautiful white flowers, a bit like um, a candle wick. Um, and, and as we get further into September, they're going to go pink. And then eventually the flower heads will, um, each of those little petals goes crispy and brown. 
um, but the pruning instructions tell me to leave those. And when we get to spring, I have to cut um, all the branches off the bush right down to 30 centimeters above the ground. So I've got this great big bush and my instructions are cut it right back and I cut it right back and it looks dead, it looks terrible because all I've got is a few sticks 30 centimeters off the ground. But almost as soon as I've cut it, these little green buds appear where I've cut it. And then out of the buds, the shoots come. And of course, out of the shoots, the flowers come because that's the only way the flowers will come is off these new buds, not off the old sticks. Um, but actually, it's difficult. It feels drastic, but it's the kindest thing to do. And actually, to prune something is to care for it. And, and God has this line about pruning us because he cares for us, because it's the kindest thing to do, because he wants us to grow in a good way and to bear good fruit. He wants us to stop doing the things that harm ourselves and others and to do the things that bring um, life to us, that are good for us and good for others. But I don't know about you, that I find that, that it's an uncomfortable process, isn't it? Personally, I find it often happens, um, you know, I'll be in church and I will hear um, somebody speaking or there'll be something that we've sung. Or I'll read the Bible and something will strike me and I think, oh, I'm going to have to do something about that in my life because actually um, that's not quite right what's going on there. Um, somebody may you know, come up to me or there may be some circumstance and I think, okay, my behavior hasn't, hasn't been good in that particular place. And it doesn't feel comfortable, but it is, God does this out of love because he wants us to live fully in, in the joy that he has for us. And so one of the things that we might do in prayer at this point in, in, in the year is to say, Lord, what is it that you'd like to change in me? What is it that maybe I need to stop doing? And what is it that I need to start doing? In order to give ourselves the space to participate in this pruning, in this loving care that God has for each one of us. And so pulling all this together, we're at the start of a new term. Um, and God is offering us this beautiful picture of what it is to bear fruit in him. Um, to remain deeply connected to him. To give ourselves time to explore that with him and all that he has to offer us. To be reassured that he is going to bear fruit in us. That actually the spirit is working in us to bring about that fruit. That we might be witnesses to those around us across our city, in our neighborhood. He longs for people who don't know him to come to know him. And we don't do any of this individually. Um, that picture of a vine, there isn't one branch in a vine, is there? There are so many branches together. So he doesn't ask us to do any of this on our own. He brings us together. He brings us together so that we live in Jesus together as a church family. And we find this encouragement and support um, from one another as we come on a Sunday um, as we go into a group, as we join teams, as we explore faith on Alpha, we do this together. We're not asked to do it on our own. And, and that is amazing because it's difficult to do on your own. But he invites us into a community where alongside one another, we help each other to remain in Jesus, in the love he has for us, to deepen our relationship and to bear fruit together.